So my second presentation is about um, hormones and radiation. And so, again, uh, this is my disclosure, but now I'm just going to read the first paragraph, who we are. ABS is Society of International Interventional Radiation Oncologists, and this is new, that <clears throat> we just inserted it. So we are a Society of Interventional Radiation Oncologists and Allied Professionals. We deliver uh, precise high-dose radiation to cure cancer. So this is who we are. Okay, so why is this important? What is the ADT benefit? Who benefits and who is actually harmed from ADT? And what can we do to reduce the need for ADT? So these are the topics that I'm gonna to address today. So why combine ADT and radiation? So ADT does impact microenvironment of the tumors. And so what I explain to my patients is that when we give you ADT, there is no more testosterone, there is no food for cancer, so kind of cancer starves and becomes weaker, so when we give you radiation, it works much better, which is actually true. But ADT also has synergistic effect on both local and distant subclinical disease together with radiation. So as you all know, we use a lot of ADT in prostate cancer, and approximately 50% of all patients who are diagnosed get ADT, and those who fail get ADT lifelong. So why is this important? Well, it is important because men tend to be quite miserable in ADT, and so these are the side effects. A lot of quality of life issues, a lot of cognitive dysfunction, osteoporosis, metabolic syndrome is a huge problem, and then there is cardiac complications. <clears throat> There is cardiovascular mortality, three and a half to 6% access while patients are on ADT, and sudden death. So what is the benefit of ADT and radiation? There's a lot of randomized controlled trials done over the last several decades to actually show that in locally advanced prostate cancer, if you, have, if you add ADT, ADT will increase cause-specific survival, PSA recurrence-free survival, but it will also increase overall survival to about 10 to 13 percent over ADT alone or over external beam radiation alone. We also learned that ADT longer is better than shorter, and even if you give higher dose of radiation, you still need ADT. So you have seen this graph this, this morning, and so on your Left side is ADT yes or no, so there is a huge improvement in overall survival if you add ADT, even up to six months. And then on the, on the other side is ADT short or long, so again, longer is better than the short ones. And so this is overall survival, absolute difference. There is the wonderful meta-analysis published recently actually looking at 12 randomized controlled trials, over 10,000 patients in median follow-up of 11 years. It's a very long follow-up. And uh, the addition of ADT or longer ADT actually improves meds free survival by about 8% to 10 years and overall survival by about 6% to 10 years. But I also want to kind of just point out your attention to slope of these curves. And I talked to you this morning about reporting five years of outcomes after external beam radiation. Look at what happens at 10 years and 15 years. Okay. So who benefits from ADT? Okay, so I'm just gonna explain this graph a little bit. So here we have all risk groups stratified, and in the middle is unfavorable intermediate risk and favorable high risk, and they tend to, tend to kind of behave biologically the same. So on the top, you have external beam bar, which is very long, so which means everybody needs ADT if you give them external beam radiation. Apart from low-risk patients, they don't need ADT. And at the bottom, you have brachytherapy in the yellow bar. So these are the patients who actually need ADT if you give them radiation. So much shorter bar, as you can see. Okay, so then the question was, in these kind of favorable intermediate risk and partly unfavorable intermediate risk, do we actually need ADT? And so there's a recent randomized trials, NRG0815, to look at, well, if, can we get away with not giving ADT to these patients if you actually give them high dose of radiation? 
So 1,500 patients now with median follow-up of 6.3 years. And it seems that overall survival is the same, so no difference whatsoever. However, there is a bit of a better progression-free survival, METS-free survival, and prostate cancer-specific survival. However, the absolute difference is 10% for PSA failure and only 3% for distant METS. So toxicity was higher, obviously, in the group who got, ready, uh, who got um, hormones. And all adverse effects were 69% in the group that got hormones versus 21 in group that did not got hormones. So huge difference in quality of life. Now the question is, is this worth it? Really, is this worth it? And what is really the benefit to harm ratio with hormones? Okay, so this is again the graph that I love because all the randomized trials are really summarized here and is this absolute difference in you know, ADTS versus no, and the blue bars are intact prostate and the red bars is post-prostatectomy salvage radiation. <clears throat> and I talked to you this morning about potential detriment effect of ADT if you give them to relatively low risk patients who are going to get salvage radiation. And again, same thing here, ADT short or long, long is better. So that's the, the bottom line. So then what is, the, what is the harm? Okay, so if you look at non-randomized population-based data, you do see that ADT decreases overall survival by about 10 to 15%. But if you look at randomized controlled trials, you do you see that ADT actually improves overall survival by about 10 to 15 percent. So which is it? How do we explain this? Well, there is a really beautiful meta-analysis in JCO a few years ago that look at observational versus randomized control data. And what is shown that observational in observational studies, patients actually do much worse. And these are the patients we all see in the clinics. Who participates in randomized controlled trials? Only one to two percent of all the patient population. So these are usually younger patients. They usually have better performance status. In addition to that, randomized controlled trials do not report actually fatal, only report fatal events, but not, not fatal events. So that's why there's a difference. So what is the ADT harm? So usually people have this kind of notion in their, in their mind, but if I only give them four to six months, nothing is going to happen. That's actually not true. These events tend to be quite early, particularly if the patients had recent heart attacks. So they, as you can see on this graph, the highest incidence actually is the first four months after you put somebody on ADT. So who is the, uh, at risk for, for worse cardiovascular toxicity? Those who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease. In particular, those who had heart attack a, a year prior to you starting them on ADT. Age 65, which is majority of our patients, and longer ADT duration. So if you have a man who is over 65, previous MI, which is very common in our practice, and risk of cardiac mortality may actually outweigh the survival benefit of hormones, and the optimal duration of ADT is a function of comorbidity, patient age, and the number of cardiac risk factors. So we have to be very careful with this. Okay, so then there is a long-standing question. How about agonists versus antagonists, right? So what I'm going to present you here is just overview of, so so in, in, in the table, you have an overview of meta-analysis, and I have added here on the other side, Nelson and all in 2023, another meta-analysis. So all of these um, squares that are colored in purple are in uh, studies that are in favor of antagonists. So I just want you to look at a purple squares. So here we go. Here, purple squares, meta-analysis. So basically, there is four meta-analysis, they're in favor of antagonists, and one is non-significant. This is pharmacovigilance data. All the studies are in favor of antagonists. This is real-world um, health insurance data. Well, this is kind of 50-50, so to speak. And then there's randomized controlled trials. And there is two that I would say they're positive. One is a very small Miguel trial. The other one is HERO, and I'll talk to you about it in a second. And there is pronounced, which was negative, which was really a kind of a monkey in the ranch. 
So 13 studies are in favor of antagonist and six are not. So just look at the big, big picture and the big number. Okay, pronounced study, I talked about that um, yesterday a little bit. Essentially, patients who had significant cardiovascular risk factors were involved in the study, and there was basically no difference between agonist versus antagonist, and this was a massive surprise. And the bottom line of entire study is that all the patients were managed by cardio-oncologists, or cardiologists, if you wish to call them. Every single patient was appropriately managed. Their cardiovascular risk and disease was appropriately managed. And then there is a HERO trial, and so we had a presentation yesterday about the oral um, anta antagonist, and what I was told that FDI does not really recognize this curve, and there's really no difference because this, primary, this was not a primary endpoint of the study. And I'm going to say, fine, this is okay with me, and this is okay with FD FDA. However, I think the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is pay attention to, to, to patients' cardiovascular disease. So whether you give them antagonists, whether you give them agonists, it's totally up to you. But please send them to see the cardiologist if they need to be seen by the cardiology. And so how can we reduce the need for ADT? Again, I talked about that. This is, again, the Japanese trial that showed in high-risk patients, six months of ADT is enough. Now, how about external beam radiation? So here is that almost like a mirror trial, EORTC. Also look at randomization between six versus 30 months of hormones. And the absolute benefit to longer hormones is 24% versus Japanese trial, the absolute benefit to longer hormones is zero. So with BRCA boost, there is superior disease outcomes, shorter ADT duration, and less ADT toxicity overall. So how about extreme risk prostate cancer? So we started to add now ARPIs, but they're also extremely cardiotoxic. They're very, very cardiotoxic. So STAMPI trial also shows that if you now add ABI to standard of care, you actually have improvement in overall survival and METS free survival, and this is not insignificant. So these patients need to be managed appropriately, and there's other studies that actually support use of ARPIs. So here is the conclusion. What is the ADT benefit? Well, about 10% in high-risk patients. In intermediate risk patients, there's really no overall survival benefit, but 10% benefit to PSA recurrence-free survival, and about 4% to METS-free survival. And who benefits from ADT? All patients who are getting external beam radiation, exception are those who have low-risk disease. And what about the harm? Well, patient selection is going to be extremely important. Is shorter ADT duration less toxic? Well, perhaps not so. And agonist versus antagonist, may be antagonist if somebody has cardiovascular disease, but please refer to cardiology. And lastly, how do we reduce the need for ADT duration? I would say use brachytherapy for sure. And surgery, of course, is a good option, providing that patients are not going to need salvage after that. Thank you.